Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Thrive Center for Human Development. We are delighted that you're joining us today for this webinar uh, addressing the issue of the, the topic of the church and trauma in times of the pandemic. We have, we're glad you're joining this uh, webinar designed for clergy and faith leaders in these unprecedented times that we have been living. Uh, we welcome you wherever you are. We are uh, uh, recording um, this uh, event from Pasadena, California, but we are delighted uh, that folks are throughout the states and perhaps in other countries joining us. Welcome. I want to um, highlight to you that, that we are um, having this webinar with the sponsorship of the Thrive Center for Human Development. Uh, Dr. Pamela King is the executive director of this uh, center that seeks to promote a vision of human thriving based on science and spirituality. And our goal is to create resources that inspire and inform communities, uh, faith communities, uh, youth, um, anyone that can um, benefit from some of these resources. So thank you to Thrive for sponsoring this event. Today, next, uh, we have the privilege, the honor of um, uh, running this webinar with um, two of my colleagues, by the way, who I admire and have worked closely in um, uh, multiple settings. We have Dr. Joe Currier, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology. He's also a licensed psychologist, by the way, at the University of South Alabama. Dr. Currier is an, a trauma expert. He um, uh, works very closely with the veteran community, um, doing a lot of research and intervention. Um, he also has an expertise and an interest in moral injury and uh, how faith issues are related to trauma um, intervention and practice. Um, Dr. Curry has uh, worked in El Salvador, in Colombia, addressing uh, the impact of uh, trauma and exposure to community violence um, among those populations. We're also delighted to have Dr. Tommy Givens, who is an associate professor of New Testament studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. Um, Dr. Givens is um, also a world traveler uh, in, and done, has done a lot of work in uh, Spain, Colombia, China, the Middle East, um, uh, and informing and engaging faith leaders, clergy in uh, those, um, um, uh, settings as well as the United States, of course, um, with uh, theology and, and new perspectives from the New Testament. And he's particularly interested in trauma and suffering and how we may meaning uh, theologically and biblically uh, based um, uh, out of those experiences. And um, your humble servant here, Dr. Ro Lizette Rojas Flores, I am Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology, also a licensed psychologist at Fuller Theological Seminary. I, I am interested in trauma work and the, and the impact of community violence, um, especially among children, families. Um, and I have worked in, um, in El Salvador and Colombia, as well as here in the United States, looking at different, how adversity impacts um, uh, communities of faith and particularly uh, families and children. So welcome, we have a lot to say. Um, we are hoping that you can engage with us. Uh, at the end, we're going to have uh, a time for questions and answers uh, uh, next. Uh, so be mindful of that. Um, uh, start putting your questions, your concern in the chat um, uh, section of this um, webinar, and we will try our best to answer and engage with you you uh, and your concerns. A quick roadmap of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to set up the COVID-19 pandemic as a crisis um, that the church has to contend at this moment in time. Let me define what trauma is and extend the issue of trauma to understand the impact of, uh, in terms of uh, morality, moral injury, and, um, and, and pushes us faith leaders and clergy to really take a stand of a trauma-informed faith stance um, to address this issue within our congregations. We'll try to come up with some uh, tips, helpful tips for you for moving forward. And we'll leave you with some resources that would be readily accessible for you as PDFs and links on the website. 
um, and we'll uh, end up with some uh, live questions um, uh, session for Q&A. So that's the roadmap for today. Welcome again uh, to all of you. Uh, uh, let me uh, go ahead and just introduce um, what, how we're going to be moving here. Thank you, next. So the COVID-19 pandemic is really a massive public health crisis of global proportions that we are experiencing right now. Um, and, you know, in the field of psychology, we understand that a, a crisis event is a major event outside the range of ordinary experiences that is extremely threatening to those who are involved. And, you know, and it's accompanied by feelings of powerlessness, powerlessness, uh, horror, terror, um, uncertainty. And so when I describe, when I describe the crisis, uh, you get to see the point that the COVID-19 pandemic has created extraordinary situations for our generation, with uh, many countries still being on lockdown. We have now lived uh, 14 months of pandemic life, believe it or not. <laughs> And millions have endured a year of grief, of anxiety, of isolation, and rolling trauma. So I, I don't even have to, uh, to uh, uh, go over the details here, but I do want to emphasize that the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus has infected millions of people and killed thousands across the globe. And we, um, and even though the, uh, we are emerging from the pandemic here in the United States, um, which, by the way, is a very privileged high-income country, um, uh, we're beginning to look you know, at our life before and post-pandemic. We have that privilege to move forward that way. But there are many other countries that are, not, are still suffering extraordinary loss due to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and lack of access to vaccines. I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that as we move post-pandemic as a congregation, we need to be mindful of the effects of crisis, uh, that this crisis has posed for us, and that they're not going to go away rapidly, even with the vaccine. You know, the impacts, the psychological impacts are long and lasting for many. And in our congregations, our communities, we are going to be continue having to wrestle with the effects of trauma and grief and loss. Um, so let me just kind of define for you what trauma is. I think it, it as we move forward, it's, it's, it's um, behooves us to have a very good understanding of what trauma is. Next. So let me just um, use this definition that comes from uh, SAMHSA. Uh, which is a group of a working group of researchers and uh, uh, psychologists and trauma survivors. And they came up with this definition of, of trauma that I find very helpful, particularly um, for those um, uh, working in community settings. Individual trauma results from an event, underscore, series of events, or a set of circumstances, experience, by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful of life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And I think this framework is particularly helpful for us uh, because it, it uh, underscores the complexity of trauma so let me start by um, helping you unpack these three key elements of trauma. Next, the event. So when we focus on the event, the, 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 fo the, the, uh, the focus of the events uh, placed on, on the cause or the root of trauma is the environment. It's outside the individual. It's an extraordinary event out of the control, uh, outside the control of the individual that is sudden, powerful, usually outside of ordinary, um, human experience and that generates a very strong emotion, very strong affect, and, and it has a strong effects on people and that may overwhelm their capacity to effectively cope with such a, a situation, okay? So be mindful of the event that it, it's indicating for us it's outside, it's uh, out, of, out of the ordinary, and there's a wide range of uh, events that can potentially cause harm. You know, you can think of um, the pandemic as a, as a, 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 
uh, an event, uh, a, a natural a disaster, a natural disaster that has uh, created a number of problems. Think about forced separation, accidents and war. Those are type of uh, uh, um, circumstances, event um, that can generate uh, potentially traumatic events. Um, but now with the pandemic, then you have uh, uh, one type of event, the massive public health disaster, but also we, because we have been living it for uh, quite a while, 14 months to be precise, uh, we now, uh, there is also a range of other trauma potentially traumatic events that have come along with it. For instance, the uh, tragic loss of, uh, of loved ones due to COVID. Um, uh, at the height of the pandemic, many uh, of, of uh, uh, didn't have the opportunity to to uh, to bury and 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 grieve the loss of those loved ones. They, to engage in the rituals to say goodbye to those loved ones. Uh, for those that uh, survive um, um, uh, contracted COVID um, and ICU survivors, they might have experienced trauma caused by events that were well intentioned. Uh, such as medical procedures. Um, now, in terms of all the contexts that might be happening, uh, remember, we were on lockdown. Many um, uh, folks um, around the country and out in, in around the world, especially we think of vulnerable populations like um, women and, and children, they were exposed to uh, uh, potentially more domestic violence. Actually, we know that the, the rates of domestic violence um, and uh, child abuse increased during these times. Um, so want to highlight, uh, there's a range of uh, events that include abuse, human perpetrated violence, that includes loss in traumatic ways. And there are also a set of circumstances that over time, those chronic stressors accumulate and can, can, uh, can cross trauma and actually um, exacerbate uh, the problems of trauma. So we, with, uh, they can produce white stress, uh, stress and intensity uh, in, in uh, other problems that we may have. And you know, in the states, you you know quite well that we the we have had a social reckoning, where we have seen structural and cultural violence at its very best uh, or worst. Let me put it that way, uh, with um, uh, uh, racism and uh, all kinds of other things happening that definitely associated by. Uh, um, uh, that has exacerbated the, the problems with psychological distress and trauma. Um, and those social conditions are faced by many, racism, poverty, inadequate access to safe, li uh, safe living and so forth. So I think what I wanna emphasize here is for faith leaders, it's very important to understand that trauma is caused by extraordinary abnormal events outside the range of the individual, that they might get worse by additional stressors um, and, 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 and that e, when we focus on the events, then we are moving from the, hey, what's wrong with you? Come on, shake time, but move on to more like what happened to you? What's going on around you um, that are, is, is um, moving into this, is, in, um, that is setting you up in this, in, uh, to experience this traumatic, uh, potentially traumatic events. Next. The other aspect of the definition of what trauma is, is the fact that the experience is experienced by the individual as threatening, as not safe. They're not psychologically or physically safe. And this is also very important for us as clergy to understand that uh, we must focus on providing physical and psychological and spiritual safety for those who have experienced those events where they don't feel protected. We have to um, uh, make sure that we provide that physical um, harm, uh, safety from physical harm. And in these times of the pandemic, perhaps it's, uh, you know, protections from uh, uh, co uh, 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 COVID infection, exposure uh, from maltreatment, you name it. Uh, and because we have to be mindful that the, a traumatic experience often shatter, shatters the sense of safety um, uh, um, that one may experience uh, or protection from others. And the psychological experience 
um, um, uh, of uh, not being safe can be counter up in our communities, precisely with the interpersonal relationships, with the, with the uh, 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 sense of safety that we can provide in uh, safety and trust within our communities. So um, experience uh, a, traumatic, a potentially traumatic event is not experienced by, uh, by everybody the same way um, and not everybody develop, uh, develops trauma, but it's very important to be mindful of the uh, safety issue that is so crucial when we're talking about trauma. Next, and I'm going to go quick on this. So I, I'm sure many of you um, have heard about the potential broad effects um, of trauma. And I think we need, we, depart, we need to depart from the recognition that we are multidimensional beings, right? You know, we have, uh, our, uh, uh, we, 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 we have a mind, a body, a soul, and traumatic events affect all of those aspects, the psychological, the physical, the relational, the spiritual domains of a person. In other words, the body, the mind, the soul are impacted. And so it behooves us as clergy, as faith leaders, to be mindful of those signs of effects of trauma in all aspects of their lives. Uh, of our congregants, of ourselves in, in many ways. So bodily reactions, cardiovascular problems, uh, increased heart rate, pains, aches. Um, um, uh, think about the mind and how uh, your impact, uh, the, uh, a traumatic event, uh, a situation out of the ordinary robs all your energy and you are thinking constantly about what happened, intrusive thoughts, uh, excessive worries, anxiety, loss of concentration, I'm not being uh, exhausted here because my goal, our goal is not to make you diagnosticians, to make you clinicians. That's not your role. <laughs> there are folks that are trained to do that. But you, uh, the more you are aware of the signs and, um, and, and, and symptoms of the signs and effects of trauma, the better you are about linking and supporting others. And then the, the soul, the connection to others. God made us to, as, uh, as, uh, to be in community. Um, he, cre he, he, he created us to be in connection with him and connection with others. And trauma has a, a, a unique way of shattering that sense of trust in community, in others, and shattering that sense of connection with God because you end up with many existential crisis, faith crisis, um, and, and, and questioning why will a glowing God allow so much suffering at this moment? So let me just um, uh, next uh, end up with this um, uh, slide and pass it on to Dr. Courier, but I want to highlight two things. One is what I just described as the, uh, what trauma is and how you might recognize it and understand it. Um, does not happen only to your congregants. You as a, 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 a first responder in some ways, as a, as a caregiver of your, the congregants of your, in, in, in your church, in your uh, parish, um, <clears throat> will uh, be also exposed to trauma. We call it in psychology, vicarious trauma. And, and it's a process and th those negative changes that occur as a result of the exposure to all the people's trauma and suffering. And basically they're similar to, to, the, to those that the effects that the survivors experience uh, of trauma. Um, and what happens is that the faith leader, the caregiver may have experiences, changes in one's perspectives about themselves, feeling vulnerable, feeling um, um, sad, depressed um, about others, um, uh, pessimism, distress, and about the world and God. And so this is this topical trauma is very extremely relevant for the care of your community, faith community, but a bit for the self care of, of, of you as uh, uh, the uh, frontliner, the, the, uh, um, the first responder. Uh, God has called us to be out there, but us as uh, um, faith leaders, we have to put the armor to protect ourselves. And vicarious trauma uh, 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 really um, um, highlights for us and underscores for us the, the need, the, the 
uh, for for clergy to self care, to have routines uh, for to self care physically, emotionally, spiritually, intentionally, uh, often um, times. I'm going to stop here. Um, actually, maybe one of my colleagues have a question for me. We want to be engaged in here, um, so let's let's talk about this. I had a question, Lisa. If you want to take one for me, this is Tommy here. Go ahead, yes, please go. Great to have everybody here, by the way, uh, and I'm glad to be part of the conversation. But as I was listening, Lisette, one question that came up for me is how uh, people navigate trauma based on how they've been formed before that traumatic event happens. So, uh, you know, we know that some people, when they face traumatizing events, tend to fare better than others depending on how their life has been shaped before that moment. I wonder if you could just say a word about how faith leaders might be thinking about not just responding to, to trauma after it's already happened, but in anticipation of it, what kind of people are we trying to cultivate? How are we trying to encourage them to live, understand their lives so that when those traumatic events happen, they'll have more resources to be able to face them? Hmm. Very good question and a lot of questions, Dr. Givens. <laughs> Let me just say, I, I think you highlighted two, uh, two things that are, that are, I would say, that are quite important for us to think. Uh, and that is when you talk about trauma, and when I mentioned about the event, you're not, uh, you know, if you're trying to support someone who has experienced a potentially traumatic event and is exhibiting some of these effects of trauma, don't get stuck in just what happened in the event. You know, get to know the person at, and, and what happened before get to know the life story, right? Because oftentimes they might have other events that have occurred in their lives. And this particular event that you're aware about was kind of like the final straw that brought the camels back. Um, and so it, and having that life history, that, that, that uh, knowledge of that person's uh, life would be very, very uh, helpful. Um, because it will tell you about some of the risks, some of the their uh, diff uh, difficulties that they might have experienced in the past, but also the strengths. How in the world, if they have all these other events, were mm. they able to cope and be resilient, move, flourish, right? So it gives you that sense where you can hang your hat on the strengths and at the same time be mindful of the uh, history of suffering that they, this, this person might experience. Now, there are groups that are more vulnerable than others, women, children, uh, folks that, that are uh, um, underprivileged due to socioeconomic uh, um, status or uh, 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 even uh, race. Um, uh, you know, think about the social reckoning that we're going under. So the accumulation of stress and trauma can set you up to um, uh, to be in a, in a place where you're more vulnerable. So when a, something that extraordinary and demanding emotionally happens, you basically have very low tank. Mm. Your fuel tank is, is not quite uh, there. All right, I'm going to stop there. There's much more to say to that, but fantastic question. Thank you. So, Dr. Curian, take it on from here and add more to this conversation. Wow. Um, well, it's an honor to be with everybody today. Um, so I'm coming to you from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, there was a point in time where both um, Dr. Rojas Flores and uh, Dr. Givens were colleagues of mine at Fuller. Um, so it's it's wonderful to... Um, be with everyone, you know, in the Fuller community today. Uh, the question Tommy asked is, um, it's, it's literally a, the trillion dollar question, <laughs> yes. right? And, and there's so many different ways, you know, that we could answer that question. Um, I would just want to affirm, you know, your response, Lisette, that uh, as, as faith leaders, you have a very important role to play um, to, to prepare your folks to be able to suffer well. Mm -hmm. in the event of a trauma mm -hmm. okay and you know whenever this question comes up for me I, I, I also you know just want to highlight the fact that um, it is not possible to inoculate people from becoming traumatized okay yes. that there are certain types of events or experiences where it doesn't matter how strong you are how resourceful you are how well connected you are um you may become traumatized and you may experience, you know, great psychological and spiritual pain. 
Mm -hmm. And if that happens, it's okay, yeah. right? Um, what often ends up happening is people feel shamed and they isolate and they disconnect themselves from community. And we don't want that to happen. So faith leaders, please don't allow your people to feel shamed um, if they do end up suffering. Um, um, really appreciate um, Lisette's comments. Um, you know, as, as she was, you know, speaking, um, you know, I, I just found myself, you know, just wondering, like, how does trauma affect the soul, you know, the soul of a person? And uh, I'm going to talk with you now, you know, a bit about uh, moral dimensions, you know, of trauma, you know, so historically, um, mental health professions have steered clear of um, topics of morality. Um, obviously, people like Tommy, theologians, philosophers, um, people within art and literature have long, you know, been interested, you know, by issues, you know, of morality, um, psychology, other mental health professions are changing, you know, so it's important to highlight, you know, that, you know, traumas occur sometimes, you know, by what we might call natural evil, right, where there's, you know, disasters or, you know, act, quote, unquote, acts of God, and we can debate whether that's an even accurate statement to make, um, but, um, more often than not, the traumas that affect people most deeply are human perpetrated traumas. And, you know, whenever another human being visits violence or trauma on another, there's always a dimension of morality. And I think what we're learning is that these moral dimensions of trauma um, are really, really important. And they really are matters of the soul. You know, so when we talk about morality, it's important to you know, highlight we're not talking about right and wrong. I mean, we are talking about matters of right and wrong, but really what we're talking about with morality is um, the, the human, unique human capacity to be connected, to belong in communities and to pursue lives of meaning and significance, right? That that's the function of morality in human life. And when that becomes challenged, or unravels, um, someone usually suffers very, very greatly. Um, slide. You know, so uh, there's a lot of um, increasing interest in the concept of moral injury, and I'm going to define like what we mean by moral injury in just a minute. Um, you know, but you know, I think it's important to highlight that um, this concept of moral injury is not a new concept. Um, it's been around, you know, for millennia you know, in other disciplines within even mental health professions, um, I think psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, you know, we've long observed that morality matters, right? So I, I'm not gonna read this quote in its entirety, but, um, you know, friend, colleague of mine, uh, Kent Drescher found this quote when we were doing, you know, some research, um, you know, in recent years. So, um, so this quote comes from an article that was published in 1951 um, in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And um, this is an observation of a couple psychiatrists, um, Futterman and um, Pupian uh, Midland. I hope I said that name correctly. Please forgive me if I didn't. Um, but these psychiatrists were working with World War II veterans um, in the five or six years you know, after um, you know, the war ended. And um, you know, they were sharing their clinical observations. And, you know, and what they observed was you know the events you know that really haunted um, you know their patients the most. So these are folks who are suffering from PTSD and other trauma-related conditions greatly. But the events that haunted people the most were um, situations where you know their patients believed that they engaged in actions or um, did not engage in actions, and they wish they did. Um, you know, that um, harmed or damaged their moral code. And that folks who are having these issues that were often accompanied by great guilt and shame, these were the folks who had the hardest time um, reintegrated into civilian life. Okay, you know, so we're learning um, that moral injury is um, relevant to other populations besides military veterans and service members. Um, so I think some of the major ones, you know, would be other helping professions, um, like uh, first responders, healthcare professionals, um, you know, clergy, you know, I would put you, you know, on this list, right? That, 
any profession where you know your um, job is um, defined by you know trying to alleviate suffering and promote wellness, right? That any any one of these professions you're going to come into count you're going to encounter great human suffering and you know what we might call evil, moral evil, and um, it can be very difficult to deal with. Um, next slide. All right. So, uh, how does a moral injury occur? Um, well, um, there, there, there are you know several different types of events um, you know that might lead you know to a moral injury. So the the grid you know to the right of this slide you know provides you know a summary of different categories of events that could lead you know to a moral injury. You know, so in general, moral injury is thought to emerge you know after exposure to severely morally troubling events that might fit into two categories. You know, so first, you know, there can be um, traumas um, that entail actions or decisions in which, you know, an individual seriously transgresses a moral belief or value by what they did or by what they failed to do. You know, so these would be, you know, acts of omission, um, you know, based on what you did or what you wish that you would have done or what you could have done differently. Um, you know, second, um, you know, there can be, um, you know, events related to what other people do, um, you know, that violate one's, you know, deeply held, you know, values and beliefs. You know, so um, in terms of the role of someone who might experience a moral injury, um, you know, someone can, might experience a moral injury on the basis of being a perpetrator. Um, someone can experience a moral injury on the basis of being a witness. Um, or, um, you know, someone can experience, you know, a moral injury on the basis of being a victim you know, of someone else's moral wrongdoing. Um, in a minute, you know, I'm gonna show another slide, you know, about some of the warning signs related to moral injury. Um, you know, but what we're learning from research is that um, it, the role of an individual it, in the event is really, really important because that's gonna shape, you know, sort of the configuration of the symptoms or the suffering, you know, that you're gonna see. Um, you know, the image, you know, to the right here is of a broken compass. And uh, I like this image because, you know, it just really seems to capture, you know, the experience of um, what it's like to, to be morally injured, right? You know, so to experience moral injury is to feel like you've somehow lost your basic sense of humanity, that you no longer belong to the human family anymore. And that, um, your capacity to make moral decisions, you know, and to negotiate intimacy demands or demands in other social relationships, you know, that that's been irrevocably challenged or damaged in some way. Okay, so when I was uh, kind of preparing, you know, for these uh, comments today, you know, I thought about recent cases, you know, in my, you know, clinical supervision or my own, you know, psychotherapy practice. Um, you know, that might illustrate kind of moral injury in civilian contexts, right? So, um, you know, I can share the story of a firefighter, um, you know, who came in recently, you know, for a session, and he was just profoundly sad and feeling, you know, deep shame, you know, because two days before um, he had, he got called, you know, to a house that had burnt to the ground, the family had lost everything that belongs to them. And he's in charge of, you know, the, the team and they did everything they could and they could not save this family's house. And, you know, recently the family got a brand new puppy and um, the child was really sad that the puppy was in the fire. And, you know, it's like the, you know, sort of the cliched firefighter going into the burning building, coming out with the pet. Well, that's what my patient wanted to do, except he came out with a dead puppy and he couldn't even save the dog, right? Um, well, he was um, profound, feeling profoundly guilty and sad about this, right? So what we're learning is that when moral injury happens in civilian context, it's not often about what people do. In war, this happens more often in civilian context, it's often more about what people cannot do, their limitations to alleviate suffering and promote order and wellness. Uh, slide. 
Um, in a moment, I'm going to, you know, highlight, you know, some of the chief warning signs of moral injury. Um, but, but before I do so, I just want to pause and, you know, try to help everybody to conceptualize moral injury within a broader continuum of moral stressors, you know, and outcomes. So the slide here, uh, this is a model from uh, Brett Litz and um, uh, Patricia Keurig, um, fellow psychologists who are doing a lot of work in the area of moral injury. So if you move from the top to the bottom, on both sides of this slide, you know, we go from events that occur with very high to rare frequency, um, and that happen from high to low prevalence within the general population. You know, so, you know, just thinking about what we've all been going through over the last 14 months with the COVID pandemic, you know, if you're anything like me, you know, every time you turn on the television, you open your social media, um, you know, turn on the news, uh, you encounter what we might call moral challenges and, you know, and, and that these stressors, they cause frustration, you know, to us, right? So, um, you know, there was a point in time, you know, where, where I heard a story that um, some states were literally throwing their vaccines in the garbage because they could not distribute them, you know, efficiently, right? When, you know, then we hear in other parts of the world you know, that people, you know, are dying and that, you know, that they don't have any access to vaccines, right? Well, when I heard that, like that, that made me feel really, really frustrated. Um, but if you're anything like me, um, you know, did that frustration, like, did that cause me to like not be able to function? No, I compartmentalized it, um, prayed about it, but went on with my day, right? You know, and then there can also be what we call moral stressors, you know, and that these moral stressors, they tend to be more personal in nature. They tend to affect us um, kind of more directly. Um, and because of that, they tend to be more distressing, right? So if you've ever had your trust violated, you know, from a loved one, that maybe, um, maybe you were deceived, you know, in a relationship, you know, in one way or another, right? Well, you know, that might be a moral stressor. Uh, when we talk about moral injury, you know, what, what we're talking about here you know, would be, you know, events where um, there's a clear risk of death or serious injury, right, in the situation, you know, so thinking again about, you know, what, what Seth just shared related to the definition of trauma, you know, that morally injurious events, you know, seem to occur within the context of traumatic experiences, right, so um, you know, share another case, um, you know, that I'm, I'm supervising right now. So um, case of a nurse uh, worked in the, um, the COVID unit, you know, when things were, you know, at their worst, um, you know, in our community. And she, she was supposed to, um, you know, to have the option, you know, um, to, to get moved to another clinic. Um, but, um, you know, her um, supervisors um, did not honor her request and that she essentially served kind of by herself, very isolated in the COVID unit uh, for months. Um, she witnessed so many people die. Um, it was her job um, when people were dying to hold the iPad up to the patient when they said goodbye to their loved ones, right? Um, and then, you know, she also had, you know, the risk of her own exposure because, you know, the vaccine wasn't rolled out yet. And she had to live, you know, essentially like totally separated from her husband and her children, right? Um, she's still coming to terms <laughs> with how this, you know, um, kind of period of kind of repeated exposures, you know, to the threat and possible death and loss, like other people's deaths, like how this is still affecting her. This would be what we would call a morally injurious event. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a table um, um, you know, that we generated for, for one of our recent articles. Um, you know, so you know, just to kind of summarize you know, some of the, the prominent emotions, uh, beliefs and attitudes, behaviors that you might see you know, in um, you know, what, what we might call kind of self-directed moral in, moral injury or other directed moral injury. So in cases when someone feels like they were somehow responsible for the event, you know, prominent emotions, you know, include things like guilt and shame, beliefs and attitudes to, you know, tend to involve kind of having a low sense of self-worth, 
you know, feeling unforgivable, feeling unlovable, you know, you know by other people, by God, um, you know, and that from a behavioral standpoint, what we tend to see is, you know, extreme social isolation and what we sometimes call self-handicapping, um, self-contempt, self-criticism, you know, in instances, you know, when someone was betrayed, you know, by another person's moral wrongdoing, um, prominent emotions, as you might expect, you know, tend to involve anger, disgust, beliefs and attitudes, you know, tend to see profound mistrust, alienation, um, and behaviors, you know, tend to involve um, social withdrawal and aggression, not necessarily um, outward <clears throat> aggression. What we're learning is that, you know, um, there, there, it's often kind of revenge fantasies in one's mind that if I could only, you know, just wishing harm, like profound resentment, you know, toward um, the person who, who was responsible for the event. Um, so these would just be some of the warning signs, you know, that seem to be emerging that may signify a moral injury. All right, that is it. Mm -hmm. So be glad to take a question or we can move on to Tommy. I think we'd go move on with Dr. Givens. Tommy, take it on. Okay, well, thank you, Joe. Uh, I do have maybe a question, but let's save it for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say will build on what both uh, Lisette and Joe have already shared. I want to talk uh, somewhat uh, in more biblical terms of the faith uh, in a way that might help us understand what makes it difficult for Christians often uh, in your churches to respond well to a traumatizing event, and also what might set them up to be more vulnerable uh, to traumatizing events and make their recovery or their healing even more complicated than it would otherwise be. And the context that I want to use for this is what I would suggest is one of the most predominant kind of cultural mythologies of our time that uh, we are all inhabiting in one degree or another and affects our spirituality. And that is a mythology of power that delivers us from threats in the form of superheroes. Uh, figures of superhuman power that swoop in in the midst of human loss and corruption and quickly deliver us uh, from that threat. And whether we like it or not, I think this is especially true of our young people, but it affects all of us. Uh, we sort of accommodate uh, Jesus to this mythology of superheroes. Uh, this one's pretty tame that you can see on the screen. I added a couple others for somewhat comical purposes. Uh, sometimes this is what we find ourselves or especially perhaps our young people um, leaning on when they're thinking of how God might be powerful in the world or how Jesus is powerful in our life. And if this is the understanding of God's presence, God's power that we bring into something like a pandemic, uh, we're going to be acutely vulnerable. Uh, because as we learn in scripture, this is not, in fact, the way that God is powerful in the world to bring healing and to bring hope. And if we imagine that this is the way that God is powerful in a superhero sort of way, then I think uh, we will find ourselves um, fragile uh, because we will be waiting for God to fix the problem, to eliminate the threat quickly and summarily and it won't go away. Uh, the pandemic continues. Uh, people continue to get sick. Uh, healing is not always fast in coming. And then we're forced to ask, well, what resources do we have to be able to respond to what might be causing trauma in our lives? And perhaps to reckon with the fact that we made ourselves more vulnerable uh, to those traumatizing events uh, because we went into them with a faith that was a kind of castle of cards, and it turns out that God is not the way that we expected God to be. And that can just aggravate the symptoms that both Lisette and Joe have already highlighted, symptoms of uh, isolation, a uh, sense of not belonging, uh, life does not make sense anymore, this can often lead to withdrawal, and really profound existential uh, crises 
in people's lives. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Andrea. Um, this, in short, is why a superhero Jesus doesn't help us, uh, our young people, or others to navigate the trauma of a pandemic, uh, because it expects God to intervene only as a quick fix to a deep and complex set of problems. And so instead of this, um, I think we want to turn again uh, to the witness of scripture about how God is in fact present and powerful uh, in our lives in the face of threats and to feed our resolve, our processes of healing and hope, our approach to relationships with that kind of spirituality that's nurtured by biblical testimony. What we find there is that the spirituality that Jesus especially teaches us is not one of triumphalism. Uh, Jesus does not swoop in and fix everybody's problem. I don't know if you've ever uh, paused to reflect on this, but uh, Jesus obviously deals with many sick people, and he does heal many of them, uh, but they go on to get sick again, and all of the people that Jesus heals go on to die. Uh, even when he has raised them from among the dead, like Lazarus, they go on to die later. So to imagine that Jesus is powerful by enabling us to avoid or escape suffering altogether, I think sets us up to have very few resources in the face of trauma and perhaps even to aggravate uh, traumatizing events in our life. Instead, I think we want to recognize what we see in the New Testament especially is that Jesus, uh, instead of enabling us to avoid suffering, uh, teaches us to face it and faces it with us. Uh, he is present with us in the midst of our difficulty, and it's precisely there that we often find measures of healing. Uh, when we are patient in the midst of suffering with one another, as opposed to clinging to quick fixes and then asking ourselves over and over again why God hasn't swooped in to help us. So next slide here, Andrea. This is a different image uh, by a favorite painter of mine. This is actually from a bit of curriculum that Lisette and I use to help churches navigating uh, serious kinds of trauma in Colombia. Uh, but this is a painting called The Morning Miracle Cue by Daniel Bunnell. And this is a picture of Jesus after he has been healing people all morning in a scene like we find in Matthew 8. And uh, Jesus is not simply snapping his fingers and making people feel better. Uh, Jesus uh, is tired by the work of healing that he is doing. He is feeling the pain of the people that are approaching him. And so we learn in Matthew, who's quoting the prophet Isaiah, that he took up our infirmities. He bore our diseases. He felt them himself. And it was actually in his sharing their burden with us that we found measures of healing. And when we were not immediately healed, we found the strength to be able to care for one another, uh, even in the midst of disease. There's a lot of good history of Christians doing exactly that kind of thing in pandemics in the past. So last slide. So what we're looking for based on New Testament testimony is a spirituality not of triumphalism, but of solidarity and presence in the midst of traumatizing events uh, like we've had so much of in this pandemic, such as unhealed pain and loss that we could not stop, that we could not control. And... The New Testament teaches us that God is with us precisely in those uh, situations of apparent helplessness and giving us help by the presence that God gives to us uh, in those seasons of loss. And that is going to require us to leave some room, uh, not just for a worship that is always celebratory, praising God for all of the ways that God is bringing joy to our life. We certainly need that. But a central witness that we have throughout scripture is also a way of relating to God that is called lament. Uh, lament that uh, asks uh, God for mercy and expresses grief to God. Um, Psalm 80 is a especially infamous case of this where the psalmist says, God, your wrath lies heavy upon me. Darkness is my only companion. And that's the end of the psalm. There's not a sort of hollow triumph that sounded at the end or anything like that. There's just room in the life of faith for expressing grief to God as part of the journey of faith that we're on together. So that's something that I would encourage you all 
to cultivate in congregational life uh, space for grief, for lament, in a spirituality that is not rushing to hollow kinds of triumph, but is nurturing a life of solidarity and presence in the midst of unhealed pain and loss. Questions and answers I think we want to go to now. Yes, thank you, uh, Tommy. I really appreciate uh, your reflection because it's so uh, important to, I, I think what you highlighted there for me is how trauma healing, and I'm hearing it as a psychologist, obviously, is that we recognize that trauma healing really comes in relationships, in relationship with God and relationship with others. And it's not a quick, like, this, just hang out together and shape up and move on. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? That that continuity of care, of being there, of presence um, that brings healing. Um, and, and that we know as, as, as psychologists and as mental health providers that that there's no pill for trauma or, or to alleviate suffering. Mm -hmm. That suffering is alleviated precisely in relationships. I like me. I, ha I have a question. I've got, I have a question for you. So I think, like I said, I was, um, I needed to hear that today. That was, um, man, it really ministered to me. I'm very, very grateful. So, so Tommy, imagine, you know, in, in your congregation or just in, in, you know, the work that you do, if you encountered someone that, you know, that might be, you know, experiencing, you know, moral injury or a really painful loss or trauma, how would you encourage that person to pray? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Well, I think um, I would want the person, first of all, to feel like they had a safe sp space to express whatever emotion they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And for me as a, a guide to not give them a formula that they have to fit into with whatever they're going to say to God. So to try to give them a space that allows them to verbalize, somehow express their grief and to do my best uh, to offer some words with them that feel genuine and true rather than a quick corrective or something like that. And so uh, if it's anger that's expressed at God, um, might encourage them just to speak that uh, to God and for them to hear from me as I'm sitting beside them that I can hold that with them that I don't, they don't have to expect to hear from me. You're not supposed to be angry at God. God fixes everything. Uh, but instead that someone beside them can hold their anger and share in its expression uh, to God. Uh, if it's a sense of hopelessness, that they don't know how to go on, um, that they simply have nothing that they can look to that gives them the will to continue living. Um, that's something that um, should be expressed and they should be able to find some words uh, for that. If a, if a person, as you guys know, uh, especially in the wake of trauma, just finds that they have no words whatsoever, mm -hmm. then I would be trying to do my best to read their body, to take into account their story, as Lisette said, and then maybe uh, to offer uh, some prayers from the Psalter, a few lines that I think um, might resonate with them. Maybe especially because they offer a form of prayer that they're not familiar with, an imprecatory psalm, a psalm of lament, uh, something like that, and to just allow that to fill the space and see if that enabled them then to find their own words of prayer. Uh, those would be maybe a few tactics. The other thing maybe I'd say, Joe, that you probably know better than I, is it's important sometimes when someone is struggling and having a hard time finding words to leave room for silence. Mm -hmm. not make them feel like we have to say anything. Sometimes we can just sit and by the way that we are learning to be comfortable with silence can enable them to feel comfortable not having anything at all to say to God or anybody else. Um, hearing you, uh, Tommy, you sound like a, like a mental health provider. <laughs> Some of the key issues that you were bringing up are actually have been identified as key principle for trauma-informed care, which is exactly providing the safety, the, the space for folks who have been impacted by, 
by deep suffering and trauma to to speak to find the words to take the time that trans uh, the, the 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 transparency the trustworthiness the support mm -hmm. um yeah. and the, the mutuality the collaboration not the top down like um, let me fix you no 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 it's it's, it's that kind of experience that you were uh, reflecting that I thought was, was fantastic because it's exactly some of the principles of what we call trauma-informed care that should be applied and should guide some of the uh, the, the, the structures of the church that yeah. definitely yeah. is committed to serve the suffering. Well, and for those important. pastors that might be listening or other congregational leaders or parents, the ability to provide safe space has something to do with that sort of spirituality that you've cultivated, right? It doesn't feel safe to complain about a God that's supposed to be a superhero. You know, mm -hmm. it feels to people like it's some kind of a violation. They're not being, you know, they're not being believers, uh, something like that. And it's our job as people who are cultivating the spaces of congregational life uh, to free people, I would say, uh, to feel safe, to say, um, my understanding of God right now is disappointing me. And not to feel like they've, you know, crossed some terrible taboo uh, to do that, but that that's something that's just a part of how we do church together. Mm -hmm. Great, agree. Let me just take a moment to check with Andrea. Andrea, are there any questions in the chat that we should be addressing, or should we continue this conversation here? We have questions for one another as well. Just one question. Okay. What are some examples of moral violations that could be experienced during the pandemic and how do we respond? Hmm. I guess I could answer that question. Um, I think uh, one of the primary examples um, that seems to be most common you know, would be, you know, what we might call kind of institutional betrayal, you know, when, um, you know, our uh, local, state, uh, kind of federal, you know, governments, you know, and kind of other um, kind of organizations, you know, uh, for one reason or another, um, leave us kind of marginalized and where we, we, we lose trust. Um, and we feel, um, you know, like, you know, somehow like our, our life isn't important or our loved ones' lives, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are not important. Um, you know, I think also, um, um, I think particularly, you know, for, for clergy, healthcare professionals, first responders, um, I think another moral violation is just the inability, um, you know, to, to, to be a superhero, <laughs> you know, to continue to use, you know, Tommy's, you know, Tommy's, you know, metaphor that, you know, this is not only um, kind of a paradigm, you know, that, that we utilize, you know, to try to understand God, but this is often an expectation that we put on ourselves, um, you know, for those of us, you know, who, who have a vocation, you know, of, of, of ministry or mental health profession or, or whatever you're doing, you know, if, if your job is, you know, to try to, to help people, you know, and alleviate suffering, promote wellness, um, well, like situations like the past 14 months, you know, are going to put you in situations where you know your own limitations, and you're not going to be able to save everybody, right? Um, it, the difference between us and Jesus, thinking about that image, you know, that Tommy, you know, just had on the screen that's so beautiful, um, you know, apart from his work within us, we do not have the ability to heal anybody, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, so, um, I mean, yes, we can get training, right? Um, but it, it only takes us so far. And there are, you know, certain things that happen in this world, um, thinking about the fire that I shared, you know, a few moments ago, thinking about, you know, the nurse, you know, working in the ICU, just trying to keep people alive at the height of the pandemic. Mm. Um, we can only do so much. Um, think about, I have several, I have a couple of pastor friends who are really struggling right now. Um, one of them is on sabbatical. Another one is thinking about leaving the ministry because just of how hard it's been, you know, over the last year. And that often comes, I think often from like 
feeling like we're failing, we're not living up to our mission, we're not fulfilling our purpose, right? Because we can't help everybody. So then that, that seems to be another source of moral violation. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, um, um, Joe. Well, quick, uh, I know that there is a, a question and folks are still on the line. Uh, I know we are have come to the, the, the top of the hour, but uh, there's a burning question on the chat uh, that we might want to answer. And then I will quickly end up uh, pointing you to some more resources that we have. I know this is almost like a little teaser, at least it feels for me. I want to keep talking about this issue. Um, so we're going to be pointing you to more resources um, and hopefully there'll be a part two conversation of this topic later on. But Andrea, what is that last question that you have for us? Yeah, it says, how can I help others at my church cultivate trauma-informed faiths? Many have expressed interest, but many may not feel um, knowledge about trauma or equipped to minister people in a particular way. I am, part of, I am a part of a team of deacons, so we think a lot about these topics. Mm. Tommy, do you want to give it a shot and I'll add something? Yeah, well, I, I do think Lisette might be one of the best people for this because what I think part of our purpose is, is to try to provide resources precisely for the kind of situation that you're describing. So besides sharing the recording of this webinar with others, uh, resources in the Thrive Center and elsewhere that Lisette is about to uh, identify, I think will be important. I guess I would also encourage um, a healthy relationship between psychology and and the faith. Um, in some of our settings, there's a kind of skepticism about what psychology can do, and consequently, the inability to learn um, from psychological science that I think really hurts us. So uh, to learn about these matters, I would be trying to cultivate good relationships with psychological professionals who might be invited in uh, to a meeting with deacons. Uh, we do this in my church in Pasadena and just consult um, with deacons uh, about specific cases that are a challenge in the church and just allowing that input from psychology uh, to come into your deliberations about how to care concretely for the people who are suffering in your congregation. I think that's another really live resource that is probably locally available. And I might, I don't know, Lisa, if that's something we can help with with referrals, but that's also a, a resource that I would encourage uh, you to avail yourself of. Absolutely. No, thank you. Right on. Um, yes, I, I think the fact that your church is already realizing the widespread impact of suffering and trauma is a big, big step, which means that, you know, you're learning, you're seeking out trainings, trying to understand what trauma is and all the implications at the different dimensions of our being, not just exclusively the spiritual aspect domain, but uh, uh, including all, all aspects of our being. That's a big step in creating and responding. So realizing the widespread uh, suffering um, and impact of trauma, recognize, learning to recognize the symptoms of trauma, the signs of trauma, and in yourself, and I will start with you as the faith leader, as a clergy, too, you really need to be mindful of how it's impacting you, um, but also the families, the staff, and, and create and, and, and helping them understand some of those signs to uh, think prevention. You know, we're very good at intervention, fixing the problem, but we can fix a lot of problems ahead of time if we create some awareness and, and uh, of what needs to be happening to protect ourselves. Um, as much as possible. Um, and then responding, you know, I think as you're gathering that information, then you are going to be learning more how to integrate your knowledge of trauma with your spiritual practices, with how to uh, set up procedures in the church to avoid re-traumatization, to avoid isolation, to really provide this message of we're healing together in community, we can suffer together god is here with us we are here with you that that uh, brings healing and transcendence um so uh it's it's a process and you might want to add something uh, joe i see uh, yeah i was just gonna just just really really quick and um i think I, i'm I, I have tommy's metaphor of the superhero on my mind and i guess i would just really encourage clergy and pastors you know to recognize that many of your congregants are going to want you to be a superhero as well yes um yes. and 
um, I guess I would just encourage you, you know, to, to you know to fight against that um, that need. It's not a healthy need, you know. So I, if I, I can honor my my pastors here. Um, both of them, you know, um, are adamant against that. And you know, so whether it's in the pulpit, whether it's in you know the classes that are taught, meetings that are held, whatever, you know, to try to be authentic and transparent yourself. Um, and to find ways to share your own stories of stress and suffering mm -hmm. to the people that you're leading. Um, and, you know, to find ways, you know, to incorporate mental health, trauma, suffering, you know, difficult topics, um, you know, within your, your, your liturgies, whatever they are, you know, um, I can say at our church, we, um, we sing the minor chord songs quite regularly, um, you know, so just finding ways, you know, to incorporate, you know, lament, transparency, honesty, emotional honesty within um, your ministry, I think, goes a long way in leading people to do the same in their own lives. Mm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well said, uh, Joe. Uh, next slide. So let me just highlight for you, we have been recording this webinar, and we are going to be posting the recorded version of this webinar um, and um, posting it on the Thrive um, uh, website. We will also be posting uh, these resources that we're listing here, some of them are publications um, uh, by each of our presenters here uh, that uh, take some of these issues a little farther and also contextualize it to um, particular different situations that you might be interested in. Um, and so we welcome you to tap into these resources and there are links to all their sites as well that will be very extremely helpful for you. Um, uh, and we invite you to keep learning, to keep engaging, to keep conversing um, in, within the church and outside the church. Uh, to uh, to learn how to best support those that have been impacted by uh, traumatic experiences. So we leave you next. Um, welcome. Uh, check us out in um, at the thrivecenter.org uh, website. Um, you can find more information there, and also you'll have more information on uh, uh, Dr. Courier and Dr. Evans if you want to, or myself if you want to get. Um, some more resources um, on specific uh, topics that we have discussed. I'm not, we're going to stop here because I'm mindful of the time. We want to thank you for participating with us for um, uh, your questions. I want to thank uh, uh, particularly Joe and Tommy for joining me in this webinar. It's such a fun um, experience to share with you and to talk about these issues together. We all have a passion for supporting faith communities um, with our gifts and our talents and our professions. And, and so we are uh, delighted that you have given us that opportunity to come together. So blessings to all of you. May God continue to uh, bless your ministry and um, thank you for um, supporting us. <laughs>